I had an interesting um, <clears throat> exchange with Stefano Disanayake yesterday in the comment section of my previous video. Um, along with um, Johnny Nomates, I think, think that's the, the moniker, about determinism and the will. Now, it's interesting that these two individuals seem to be positing the view that we don't have any control over what we do, i.e. they seem to be hard determinists and we're trapped in the causal chain and that's that, but at the same time they seem to be urging people to behave a certain way. Now I can see how you can justify that by saying, well I was just determined to do this and that's why I'm doing it and you know I'm not really attempting to change anybody's mind because that's impossible. Um, because they're going to think what they were determined to think and do what they were determined to do, etc, etc, etc. So I, you know, again, that one is inclined, I guess, at first glance to sort of say, well, there's a bit of cognitive dissonance going on there. But these are people who are just too intelligent for me to want to write them off like that. Um, they're not froth at the mouth kind of people or anything like that. Um, so we may be cross, uh, talking at cross purposes. If you've ever gotten into a discussion that you know people are putting forward very like interesting arguments and they're obviously intelligent people and you sort of think there's a huge elephant in the room that they simply aren't seeing, okay, there must be something in their argument that I'm not seeing. You know, um, my understanding of hard determinism is all that we ever do is that which was determined for us to do, that we don't have a will or a free will. Um, well, I don't know. Um, I can accept a somewhat determined universe in that, as I say, in the Epictetan sense where there is that which is out of my control and then there's that which is in my control. So, um, not really a compatible uni uh, uh, not a compatibilist view, but I would say in some ways, um, I do live in a deterministic universe and in other ways I don't because I have desires and desire doesn't seem to work in any way that would make any sense in a hard deterministic universe. You can say that my desires are determined, that's fine, but in order for them to actually be desires, they have to or originate with me, or else it's not desire. Um, you know, you can, it's the old thing about you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Um, I can, you know, I can be sort of, I can have all my options completely limited by a deterministic conception of reality. But the thing is about desire is it's, it's based on abstractions. Um, desire is sort of a hunger for that which is not. Um, desire is I want something that I don't have or I have an aversion to something that I don't want to have or I don't want to have happen. Um, now, desire and aversion don't fit in uh, to, the, to a hard deterministic conception of the universe. Now, I'm not saying that individual desires can't fit into a hard deterministic universe if we sort of set aside the idea of what desire is in and of itself. Um, for example, uh, I am hungry, therefore I desire food. Okay, I, uh, I can sort of explain in a deterministic manner why I'm hungry. I can explain in a deterministic manner why my body would be sort of... The body chemistry would be reacting in a certain way to produce a feeling of hunger. Um, but the desire itself, uh, the actual want, the actual deficit or whatever, if you will, can't be deterministic. It can't be explained in a deterministic uh, context. Uh, I, I spoke of this before in terms of suffering. Suffering is an experience. Um, suffering can't be explained deterministically. Suffering can only be explained in a first person, sort of driver's seat type uh, context. In other words, um, I can look at, say, through a microscope, the actions of somebody's 
um, central nervous system what suffering looks like from the outside. But that's not really suffering. I'm simply looking at a bunch of chemical reactions or nervous impulses or things like that. That doesn't translate into suffering. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at something and it doesn't make me suffer. I'm not experiencing any suffering. So you can explain what causes suffering, but what suffering actually is cannot be explained in a deterministic context. Suffering requires a subject. And yeah, in a deterministic universe, since identity is blurred, hopelessly blurred, um, to the point where I, I think it's fair to say that identity ceases to exist in, in a deterministic universe because you get this sort of um, Heracletan sort of all is flux type thing. Um, it's not that everything is in a state of flux. There is no thing to be in a state of flux. Flux itself is in a state of flux. Um, there's nothing exists long enough to ever be a thing in and of itself. There's just flux. Uh, identity is something that the mind imposes upon the external reality. As I mentioned before, this room is just matter, energy, and empty space. It's, it's roomness comes from here. Um, uh, if I were to bring an earthworm into here, it wouldn't know that it was in a room. It wouldn't care. It wouldn't understand. It, roomness is an alien concept to it. Um, so to it, it wouldn't be in a room. It would just, I don't know, uh, in its own universe. Can you imagine what an earthworm's universe looks like from its point of view? It wouldn't know what roomness is. Roomness is something that exists only in, I would assume, the human mind or perhaps certain animals that are somewhat similar to us. But again, we don't know that. We don't know how, say, a cat sees reality. Um, so identity is something that needs to be sort of imposed upon a reality that is ultimately um, completely uh, bereft of identity. As I say, all that, all that is taking place in here is the reconfiguration of matter, energy, and empty space, which is always happening. And matter, energy, and empty space, as I always like to say, are ultimately functions of each other. So there is no thing out there. That's why you have to sort of when you, if you accept the three classic rules of Western logic, not the other forms of logic out there, but Western logic, you almost have to sort of take it, as I've said before, as the Shahada, you know, sort of la ilaha la Muhammad Rasulallah, you know, there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Because you can't go any further if you, if you don't accept things like identity, the excluded middle, etc., you know, that, that sort of thing. You have to say that A is A. But my saying that A is A doesn't make A A. It doesn't. It's, it, you know, it, it, it just says that I've decided that. Which kind of brings me back to my point about, say, determinism and identity and determinism and experience and determinism and suffering and ultimately determinism and desire. Desire takes that which is and forms abstractions of that which is not. Um, say I desire a hamburger. Well, I don't have a hamburger right now. And I desire that which I have not, that which is not, I want a hamburger. Um, if I have a hamburger, but I haven't eaten it yet, I will desire to eat that hamburger because I am not presently eating that hamburger. It's sort of an abstraction. The idea of eating this hamburger, which is in my hand and not at my mouth, is an abstraction at this point because I am not eating this hamburger. Now, how you're going to come up with abstraction in a determined universe is very interesting <laughs> because everything I do is essentially, in a hard deterministic context, is essentially a reaction to everything that came before me. How do you turn around and look into the face of becoming in a determined universe? Now, that's an interesting thing. And, and this is, as I say, my view of things where in some ways the universe is determined and in some ways it isn't determined sort of helps bridge that gap. Because I might say that there's a whole pile of things coming at me that are completely beyond my control, i.e., um, you know, just where I am, where I was born, what my gender and my race are, and all this kind of thing. You know, just all this stuff, like, I guess, my facticity or whatever, or my, even my past. I no longer have any control over it. Um, but 
I still have desires for things that aren't options right now according to the causal chain. I might have, say, for example, um, a desire for, I don't know, take a stereotype sort of you know, Muslim attitude towards this. I want 500 virgins or however many a jihadi is supposed to get. There's nothing in the causal chain that says I'm going to get that. But I still desire it, you see. So where does that come from in terms of uh, hard determinism? Where does this desire for that sort of thing come from? You can say, well, I have a libido, therefore I want to do all of this sort of thing. Okay, but... Uh, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm not talking about what my body is craving or anything like that. I'm talking about forming the idea of getting these 500 virgins or whatever. Forming the idea of doing certain things that will give me these 500 virgins or, or that kind of thing. That can't be said to be in the causal chain. Um, it's, you know, any kind of desire at all involves an abstraction like that. Um, Hard determinism is the past being in complete control of the present and the present having no influence over the future because everything that you do is determined. Everything you think is determined. But the problem is abstraction sort of throws a monkey wrench into that because I take everything that has passed or everything that I've been fed and I formulate in my mind an abstraction called desire for things that are not. So that's how... I sort of think that, okay, I get it what people say when the universe is determined. And I would say that an awful lot of it is. And I'm not even saying that my desires actually can actually ever be fulfilled or that I have any control over what I desire. But for desire to be desire, it has to originate with me. Um, I can brainwash somebody into parroting the idea that, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. But the actual want itself has to come from within. You can't... Desire doesn't work. It's not something that you can feed into somebody. Um, it would be an interesting thing to see how you would actually do that. Um, how you could... I, I can see how aversions can be fed into somebody. Uh, aversions, like fears and that sort of thing. Which is why I think that aversion is not... It, it's not just the opposite of positive desire. I think it's it's a different type of desire completely. And it does seem that we actually can feed that uh, thing into people. We can play with people's aversions to get them to be averse to certain things. But desires? Huh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that desire works like that. Um, and I'm not sure even that in certain ways that aversion always can be sort of implanted into somebody's mind. Um, it just doesn't seem to actually fit neatly into any hard deterministic conception of reality, this idea of desire. Um, and as I say, you can, you can subject people to all kinds of, um, brainwashing, i.e. TV commercials, mass media barrages, fashions, all this kind of thing, and make them, I guess, think that they desire something. Like, you know, you turn on your TV and, pe you know, all you see is these home improvement shows, and it looks like they're trying to sell people on the idea of improving their homes, but what they're actually implying is, if you improve your home, you'll be a happy person. So what they're doing is they're selling this idea that we can fulfill your desires, or we can sort of influence you what you desire um, but they don't deliver you see we all know this we all know that advertising ultimately doesn't deliver it doesn't really satisfy anybody it's kind of a cliche in our society that advertising is there to get us to do stuff that we don't want to do or wouldn't otherwise want to do and desire things that we wouldn't otherwise desire and I would argue that advertising is in a way is, is in a way something that's designed to get us to want stuff that we don't want we simply don't want this stuff. But somebody is dangling it in front, of, uh, in front of us and saying, yes, I know that you have a desire for something, and this product or this idea will fulfill your desires. Now notice, it's not that they're creating a desire. <laughs> they are promising to fulfill a pre-existing desire with something that won't actually do that. That's the genius of advertising, isn't it? You know, you, you 
sell people stuff he doesn't really want because it, he, he thinks he's buying something or I think I'm buying something that will fulfill my desires when we know that it won't. If it would fulfill my desires, you wouldn't need to advertise. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't say that advertising is creating desires or it's not creating desire in the, in, in the large D sense of the term, desire. Um, it might be creating individual sort of, I don't know, spurious desires, I guess, or erroneous desires where, you know, they say you will, you will have your desires fulfilled and you will be a fulfilled human being if you buy this product. Whereas we all know that, you, that <laughs> fulfillment doesn't come in that form. Um, so desire itself is something that doesn't fit in to a deterministic matrix. And desire kind of messes up any idea that you can have say suffering or joy in a deterministic universe because desire is an essential component of both of these things you see um, unless of course we're talking at cross purposes in terms of what these two individuals were believed was hard determinism um, but hard determinism strikes me as the sort of thing that deprives you of your freedom of choice and in fact freedom of choice is something of an illusion uh, in a hard deterministic conception of the universe. But the unfortunate fact is, you know, we have these desires and aversions, which may, that the individual desires and aversions may be determined in and of themselves, but the whole idea of desire in and of itself is not a product of the causal chain. You can say, even if, like, let's say you're one of these people that, that subscribes to the idea of the will to life and that survival is the only end in things. You can say that I desire to, I don't know, have my 500 virgins because, uh, biologically speaking, I want to continue the, um, the, I want to keep my DNA going as an end in itself. I don't subscribe to that point of view, but, you know, some people, a lot of people seem to read Darwin that way. They can say, well, yes, you see, you, that desire was determined um, by your genetic uh, code or whatever. And you might think that you're choosing it, but you're not really because it was all, it was all prearranged by the causal chain that took place before you. But I would say no. All that, all that they can do is narrow down or all the, all, the, all the causality, even hard causality and hard determinism can do is determine what your individual desires might be. It can narrow your choices down. It can narrow your choices down to nothing. In fact, you may have only one choice and the whole thing, idea of choice is an illusion. But the desire or desire in and of itself cannot be explained in a deterministic context. Um, again, I'm not talking about individual desires. Desire in and of itself. Um, do I have desires? Yes. Could they be determined? Yes. Is the general phenomenon of desire itself something that can be determined? No. I'd like to see anyone prove how desire in and of itself, the whole phenomenon, the whole thing, desire thing, Desire with a capital D, as I said. I'd like to see any one positive way in which that, the phenomenon of desire in and of itself, can be explained in a hard deterministic context. I look forward to that one. <laughs>